want you to take your Bibles and I want you to go to 1 Samuel chapter 18 tonight. 1 Samuel 18, and when you find your place, let's go ahead and stand for the reading of God's Word, and we won't take a whole lot of time. We'll just read uh, the first four verses of this chapter. Uh, I did forget to uh, have our Bible reading uh, for our scripture, uh, scripture verses, so Brother Ron, it's your job when the service is concluding to wave your hand before we pray and come up and lead us in that, that, uh, that reading. That's just, this will be our last service tonight to do that. 1 Samuel chapter 18. And verses 1 through 4. 1 Samuel chapter 18, verses 1 through 4. All right, everybody there, let's go ahead and read. The Bible says, And it came to pass when he had made an end of speaking unto Saul, that the soul of Jonathan was knit with the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. And Saul took him that day and would let him go no more home to his father's house. Then Jonathan and David made a covenant because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was upon him and gave it to David and his garments, even to his sword and to his bow and to his girdle. I want to talk a little bit today about how to be a friend. And uh, we have spent the last couple Sundays talking a little bit about friendship, and we just had our friend day a week and a half ago, and Lord gave us a great day, and I'm thankful for that. And so I want to spend a little bit more time tonight on talking about, and, and eventually we'll get over to the book of Proverbs, and just give us some practical truths, some practical helps on how to be a friend, on how to be a good friend, and uh, how to make friends. And so uh, we'll look at the life of David and Jonathan as an example for that. Let's pray, and let's ask the Lord to bless us. We won't be long tonight. Father, we love you. We thank you for uh, being so good to us. Thank you for this time that we've enjoyed together in prayer. And Lord, we, we certainly acknowledge that we are a needy people. And Lord, we need your help tonight. We need your help in our lives. We, we ask, Lord, that you would minister to every need that is represented here. And uh, Lord, right now, I pray that you'd help us as we've opened up the Word, as we've read the Word. God, we pray to you that you would speak to us through your Word. Lord, help me, I pray, to be obedient to thy Holy Spirit. Lead me, guide me, Father, to say what needs to be said, nothing more, nothing less. And we'll be mindful and thankful to give you glory and honor and praise for all these things. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. You may be seated. I don't know if there's a, a better gift that God could give to us than the gift of friendship. And um, I, I said this statement here uh, two weeks ago on our friend day, but I remember when I was in Bible college and Pastor Sexton, uh, the man who was the pastor of the church where I went to school, he had made a statement one day, and he says, if by the end of your life, if you can count on one hand uh, the true friendships that you have experienced in life, you've lived a very blessed life. And I, I believe as I've gotten through about halfway of what a normal life would be, I, I, I think that's true. And tonight, as we come to 1 Samuel chapter number 18, we come to read about Jonathan and David. And I, I don't know if you take note of this thing, but uh, Jonathan and David, I mean, you can't really mention one without the other. Uh, it's kind of like when you talk about Abraham, you have to mention Sarah. And you talk about, uh, you know, Peter, you have to mention Andrew. And uh, you talk about some of these characters in the Bible, there's always someone who's kind of attached to the side, attached to the hip. And that's kind of how it is with David and Jonathan. And uh, they had a, a great bond, they had a great friendship, and... Uh, we find in this chapter, in this portion of God's Word, that, um, uh, that uh, here in this passage where Jonathan and David became two of the closest friends that a person could ever have. And I just want to talk to you a little bit and bring a couple things out in this passage of Scripture. And the first thing I want you to notice in verse number 1 is I want you to see that there was a making of this friendship. Notice what it says in verse 1. It says, And it came to pass when he had made an end of speaking unto Saul, that the soul of Jonathan was knit with the soul of David. And Jonathan loved him as his own soul. Now, if I could just get you to think a little bit about where we're at in the Scriptures. Uh, if you remember in the preceding chapter, in 1 Samuel chapter 17, David had just gotten through killing the giant. And you remember that earlier on, a few chapters before this, God had already rejected Saul from being the king. 
And Saul has already become aware that there's going to be another man that's going to ascend to the throne. That his seed, that his posterity uh, is not going to have the throne forever. But Saul doesn't know who this man is going to be. And so in chapter 17, David has just killed uh, Goliath and God has kind of used David, uh, David's slaying of the giant to bring David to national attention. Now everybody knows who David is. But here's the thing, God is not ready to put David on the throne. In fact, David's not going to be on the throne for about another 15 years. David is going to go through a period of life in which there is going to be some very hard circumstances. Uh, we don't have the time tonight, but if you were to go over to Psalm chapter number uh, 57 and Psalm chapter number 59, you're going to find that for the next 15 years of David's life, David cried a lot of tears. And all of David's anguish and all of the unfavorable circumstances that came his way actually became uh, started here in chapter number 18. And I want you to see what the Bible says. Uh, look at verse number 5. The Bible says, And David went out, and whithersoever Saul sent him, and behaved himself wisely. So the first thing I want you to know, to no fault of David's, uh, no fault of his own, David begins to have mistreatment towards him from King Saul. The Bible goes on to say, and he was accepted in the sight of all the people and also in the sight of Saul's servants. So just remember what is taking place. Saul already knows that someone's going to take the throne. Saul already knows that uh, someone has gained the favor of God. In fact, we know in preceding verses, in fact, in chapter 16, David has already been anointed to be the next king of Israel, uh, not known to Saul, mind you. And here in chapter number 18, David begins to gain the attention of all of Saul's subjects and all of Saul's servants. And drop down to verse number 7. And this is really where it boiled over for King Saul. Uh, the Bible says in verse number 6, and as it came to pass as they went, uh, when David was returned from the slaughter of the Philistine, that the women came out of all the cities of Israel singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tabrets, uh, with joy and with instruments of music. And the women answered one another as they played and said, Saul has slain his thousands but David his ten thousands. Now notice verse number 8, And Saul was very wroth, and the saying displeased him. And drop down to the latter part, uh, look at verse number 9, the Bible says, And saw I David from that day and forward. And so we find that the relationship between David and Saul began to change from this point on in David's life. And really what we find taking place, that jealousy had got into the heart of Saul and had ruined a relationship between two individuals that should have blossomed in their relationship with one another. And can I just remind everybody about what jealousy does to a relationship? The Bible talks about how jealousy is the rage of a man. Uh, the Bible talks about uh, 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 the Bible talks about in Proverbs thirty, uh, ch Proverbs chapter six, verse number thirty-four. Uh, For jealousy is the rage of a man; therefore, he will not spare in the day of vengeance. And Saul began to eye David from that day forward. Now look. From this point in David's life, things began to change. For 15 years, David would be on the run. For 15 years, David would be going through the wilderness. For 15 years, David would be separated from his family members. And David would be separated from his wife. And David would be separated from everyone that he knows and loves. And for 15 years, he would be hounded like a dog. You know what God did for David? God gave David a friend. Before David was ever going to face all of these unfavorable circumstances, before Jonathan's own father turns his back on David, God made a relationship between David and Saul. And what I'm trying to say here tonight is that a making of a friendship begins with God because I'm interested in understanding how God helped David to face such a time as what David had to face and what God did to encourage David and how God brought David through the darkest days of his life. And do you know what God did for David before David began this journey of life? 
God brought Jonathan to David. And friends, can I tell you, I'm thankful for friendships, aren't you? I, I, I'm thankful for the kinds of friendships. The Bible says that there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. I'm thankful for those types of friendships because it's those types of friendships that we need. David needed this man. David needed the encouragement. David needed the help that he got from, uh, 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 from Jonathan. And as we go through life, we are going to face dangerous circumstances, dark days, difficult times. How are we going to make it through? Well, I'm telling you, a gift that God will give us along the way is the gift of a friend. I'm thankful for those kinds of friends. I'm thankful for those that you can call up and they'll encourage you and help him. And David uh, had a friend who helped him even when his brothers wouldn't stand by him. You remember what happened in the latter chapter or in the former chapter in chapter number 17 when David came to the battlefield and he met with his brothers and David is, is excited about what's taking place and David wanted to move forward and his brothers uh, uh, began to chide him and to scold him and belittle him and his own brothers wouldn't be an encouragement and a source of help to David. But David had a friend who would help him. And friends, I'm interested tonight in being this kind of friend uh, and Jonathan was this kind of friend to David. Notice something else about this friendship, not just the making of a friendship, but notice how meaningful this friendship was. Look what it says in verse number 3. The Bible says, Then Jonathan and David made a covenant because he loved him as his own soul. Now friends, if we're ever going to have a meaningful relationship, if we're ever going to have that meaningful friendship with one another, it's going to come about through commitment. And that's what true friendship is. It's commitment to one another. And there are many hurdles along the way for you and I, but, but uh, one thing that we can stay true to is a commitment to one another. And these friends were committed. But not only that, notice in verse number 4, the Bible says, "...and Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was upon him, and gave it to David and his garments, even to his sword and to his bow and to his girdle. Do you know what Jonathan did for David? A relationship that is meaningful involves sacrifice. Do you know what Jonathan was doing for David? He wasn't just giving him the clothes that were off his back. Jonathan was giving David his princely garments. Jonathan was recognizing the fact that the touch of God was upon David's life. And Jonathan did not take the side of his father Saul, but rather took the side of God and the side of David. And Jonathan was saying, look, these princely garments belong to you. In fact, if you would, turn over to 1 Samuel 23. Notice in verse number 17, because Jonathan reveals that David would one day rule on the throne. And, and notice what it says. In chapter 23, verse 17, the Bible says, And he said unto him, this is Jonathan speaking to David, Fear not, for the hand of Saul my father shall not find thee. and Thou shalt be king over Israel, and I shall be next unto thee. That, and that also Saul my father knoweth. Do you know what Jonathan understood? Jonathan understood the fact that God's hand was upon David and Jonathan was constantly putting the affairs of David before himself. In fact, do you know what Jonathan had to do to be a friend of David? Jonathan had to go against his own father because he knew what his father was doing was wrong. In other words, there's going to be some sacrifices in having a meaningful friendship. Now look, we can take this outside of a friendship with with somebody, we can take this to the relationship of a husband and wife. If there's ever going to be a meaningful relationship, whether it be a husband or wife, or a man and a brother, or a man and a friend, or a woman and a friend, or whatever the case might be, there's going to be some sacrifice involved. I want to ask you, what kind of friend are we? Are we the kind of friend that sacrifices? Are we the kind of friend that when someone needs some time, we're willing to give it? If someone needs some money, we're willing to spend it. If someone needs an encouraging word, we're willing to speak it. Whatever is needed. Jo David needed some things that Jonathan had to sacrifice to give. It's going to cost you to be a friend. Now look very quickly, because I want to go to the book of Proverbs. I just wanted to mention this real quickly. Now notice what it says in verse number 4. And so we see the making of a friendship. It begins with God. We see a meaningful friendship. There's commitment and there's sacrifice. But notice the model. 
of friendship. The Bible says, And Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was upon him and gave it to David and his garments, even to his sword and to his bow and to his girdle. Jonathan gave everything for the welfare of another. Does this not picture someone who's the greatest friend that humanity ever had? His name is Jesus Christ. Jonathan is a beautiful picture of Jesus. And friends, the greatest friend, and I preached on this two weeks ago and I won't preach it again and go through it all again, but the greatest friend we can ever have is Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ stripped Himself of His heavenly garments and robed Himself in human flesh and came to this earth as a servant to, to save humanity from their sins. The greatest friend we have is Jesus Christ. Now, what I'm interested in tonight is how do we have a friendship like David and Jonathan? Well, I wrote some things down tonight, and I hope they'll be a blessing. And uh, let me say, first of all, to be a friend, you have to be willing to give. Now, let me show you some verses in Proverbs, all right? Let's go to Proverbs chapter number 14. And I did this wrong. I wrote this in the back of my Bible rather than on a piece of paper. And uh, I'm going to have to flip back and forth. But Proverbs chapter number 14. Now notice what the Bible says about being a friend. Notice what it says in verse number 20. Are you there? The Bible says the poor is hated even of his own neighbor. <laughs> That's true. Uh, man, for whatever the reason, most people don't like poor people because they're needy. And uh, the Bible says that the poor is hated even of his own neighbor, but the rich hath many friends. Go to Proverbs chapter number 19, verse number 4. The Bible says, Wealth maketh many friends, but the poor is separated from his neighbor. Drop down to verse number 6. The Bible says, Many will entreat the favor of the prince, and every man is a friend to him that giveth gifts. Now, I understand that this can be understood as false friends. I mean, we know that people that have more money have people that gravitate to them and just want to be their friends so that they can get something out of them. Uh, we see this in the athletic world, in the sports world, you know. Uh, there'll be a, a, a man or a woman or whatever the case might be where they uh, make a breakthrough in their sports career and they go to the pros and they make millions and millions of dollars and people from all over the area that they grew up with come crawling out of the woodwork uh, to try to mooch off them and get something from them and so forth and so on. And so we can see how this could be true in that way. But I want to tell you that the Bible is stating that a man that hath wealth has friends. And so there's, there's some logic here that we need to think about. If you want to be a friend, do you know what you need to do? Be willing to give. Now look, I'm not saying that in order to be a good friend, you have to be willing to give money because most of us are saying, man, we ain't got no money to give. You know? I mean, it takes everything we got just to support our families. But it doesn't mean to be a friend that you have to just give your money. Man, what about giving a word of encouragement? You know? What about, what about just giving some support to someone who, who needs it? What about just giving some prayers when someone's going through a tough time? What about if necessary and if, if uh, the ability allows you to? What about giving some finances and helping out uh, from time to time? Man, I'm thankful, and I won't mention the name, but from time to time, we have somebody who gives our family... Uh, uh, shampoo and soaps and, and cereal and we've had others. Man, I've had people give me a, uh, other things and just uh, trying to be a blessing. Man, that, that, that establishes a friendship, does it not? And so if you want to be a friend, look, learn to give to people who are in need. And give some words of kindness. And sometimes people just need help you know, getting caught up in, in doing some yard work. And you want to be a friend, show yourself friendly. And so here we find that Jonathan was a giver. Jonathan gave of himself to David. And the result of their friendship, the Bible says that their souls were knit together. You couldn't get more closer than Jonathan and David were. Well, what was it from? It was from the fact that they were willing to give of themselves to another. And by the way, long after Jonathan had died, David was willing to give to the family of Jonathan. You remember that Jonathan had a son? Does anybody remember his name? Mephibosheth. Say that ten times as fast as you can. Mephibosheth. And for the rest of Mephibosheth's years, he would eat at the table 
of King David. Why? Because they had a friendship that was giving. Let's give to one another. Amen? Number two, let me say this. Look, if you want to be a friend, be loyal and trustworthy. Be loyal and trustworthy. Go to Proverbs 17, verse 17. Proverbs 17, 17. Listen to what the Word of God says here. A friend loveth most of the times, and a brother is born for adversity. Did I get that right? That was the NIV version, right? A friend loveth at all times. I want you to try to get into the psyche of Jonathan for just a moment. and Think about what it cost Jonathan to be a friend to David. Jonathan's friend was the sworn enemy of his father. Saul had, in campa- had campaigns entirely devoted to the killing of David. And yet Jonathan stood true to David. You know why? Because a true friend loveth at all times. Look, I, I just had a friend of mine. in the ministry that's gone through a very tough time. And he had a lot of preacher friends before this difficulty that he had to deal with. And after the difficulty's over, I said, well, has any of these men called you and tried to pray with you? He's like, Andy, I've heard from hardly any of them. You know what that tells me? That tells me when you get to go through some dark days, you're going to find out who your friends are real quick. Because the Bible says a friend loveth at all times. And I'm not telling you that to be a friend, that means that you're going to condone someone's sin. No, I mean, you know, there's times when we have to confront our friends and tell them the truth, and I'll I'll mention that in just a moment. But the Bible tells us that a friend loveth at all times, even the times that you're not doing what's right. I remember when I got married, I had nine groomsmen in my wedding. We had a large wedding party. And looking back, there's probably a few of them that I probably shouldn't have really had in my wedding. And my brother Chris, you know, shortly after I got married, my brother Chris reads a lot, and uh, he knows a lot of these kinds of of facts and things. He says, do you know what the purpose of a groomsman is? I said, no. He says, you know, the groomsmen stand in your wedding so that one day when you get out of sorts with your wife, they go and take you out to the woodshed and rough you up a little bit, and put you back in line to get you back with your wife. And that's the purpose of a groomsman. And I never knew that. And the truth of the matter is, if we had more groomsman-type friends, we'd be doing pretty good, wouldn't we? And so the Bible says that a friend loveth at all times. How are you at loving at all times? Are you easily frustrated with your friends? Are you easily angered with them? Do we have the mentality, man, uh, you know, when we see a friend fall, when we see a friend falter, do we have the mentality that says, man, I knew it was just a matter of time. Is there a little bit of, uh, of, of rejoicing in our heart when we see a brother fall? That's not what a friend is, my friend. A friend is loyal and trustworthy. And the Bible says a friend loveth at all times. Let me tell something else about being a friend, all right? Number one, give to your friends. Number two, be loyal and trustworthy. But number three, be honest to your friends. Turn with me to Proverbs chapter 27. Proverbs 27. Just looking at a couple verses tonight that might help us. Proverbs 27. And here's what the Bible says. Open rebuke is better than secret love. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. And so my friends, can I tell you that a true friend is not going to lie to you? A true friend is not going to deceive you. A true friend is going to be honest to you. And look, if we want to be true friends, then we better have enough honesty to be forthright with them about certain issues in one's life. Listen, that doesn't mean that we have to be rude, nasty, or crude. Isn't that right? A good example of this is the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you remember when all the accusers of this woman who was caught, or at least that they say was caught in the act of 
adultery brought this woman to Jesus. And you remember that Jesus uh, said he is without sin, let him cast the first stone. Do you remember that Jesus was there willing to forgive this woman, but he certainly wasn't there to, uh, to condone this woman's sin? He told her plainly, go and sin no more. And so a good friend understands that there is a balance between compassion and honesty. And so the Bible tells us here that open rebuke is better than secret love. Do you know what I've learned? I've had some friends come and tell me things that I may not wanted to hear, but when all the dust kind of settled, I'm glad they had enough guts to tell me where I was wrong. And I have a lot of respect for them for that. And so open rebuke is better than secret love. Uh, look what the Bible says in Proverbs 28. And here's a real problem that we have in our society today. We, we have a society where we don't want to offend. We don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. We want to have a spirit of tolerating one another. But look what the Bible says in verse number 23. He that, uh, 28, 23. He that rebuketh a man afterwards shall find more favor than he that flattereth with the tongue. Friends, can I tell you that flattery is a sin in the Bible? You know what it means to flatter? Flatter means, and I didn't write the definition down. I looked it up this morning or this afternoon, but I forgot to write it down. But flattering means that you have the idea of, of trying to praise someone and trying to puff someone up and you try to uh, put them on a pedestal, uh, but without really telling them the complete truth about the situation. And so the Bible tells us here that we're not to flatter one another. So be honest with your friends. And then let me say fourthly, notice Proverbs 18.24. If we're going to be a friend, here's, here's how deep this is going to be, right? Proverbs 18.24, look what it says. A man that hath friends must, must show himself friendly. He must. If you want to be a friend, if you want to have friendships, be friendly. You know, there's a lot of people that don't have a lot of friends. And the reason being is because you've not obeyed Proverbs 18.24. The Bible says a man that hath friends must show himself friendly. Listen, if you want a friend, don't wait for someone to come and befriend you. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible says if you're going to have friends, you must show yourself friendly. In other words, you need to initiate the relationship. Uh, if you go back uh, real quickly, we're just about done, but go back and look what it says in 1 Samuel chapter number eight, uh, 18. But in 1 Samuel chapter 18, I want you to notice who it was that initiated the relationship and the friendship between Jonathan and Saul. The Bible says that the soul of Jonathan, verse 1, was knit with the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own. And the Bible says in verse number 3, and Jonathan and David made a covenant. Verse number 4, and Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was upon him. Do you know who initiated this relationship? It was Jonathan. And friends, if we're going to have friends, then we need to uh, work on being friendly. We need to work on initiating relationships. Listen, I don't believe it's of God for people to have no friends. Uh, Christians should have a lot of friends. People in town ought to know who you are. People in your apartment complex uh, ought to know you, who you are and where you live. Uh, your neighbors ought to know uh, uh, who you are and who your family is. And uh, Christmas time comes, go out and give Christmas cookies to your neighbors. Uh, when people are out mowing the grass, if you have the time and you're able to do it, get out of your car and go and see if they, they need some help. If you see them uh, carrying wood or doing whatever the case might be, help your neighbor initiate Friendships. A man that have friends must show himself friendly. Someone has said this, that friendships are gifts that we give ourselves. Think about that for just a moment. Friendships are gifts that we give ourselves. In other words, friendships don't just happen. Friendships are earned. It's amazing. I, I, I Honestly, growing up, I thought I had a lot of friends. I did. I thought I had a lot of friends. And, uh, and then I met my wife, 
And I know that not everybody on Facebook, but my wife's Facebook is just hundreds and hundreds of friends. And a couple years ago, you know, we kind of exited the Facebook scene. My wife gets on there sparingly now. If she does, she does it behind my back. But she does it sparingly, and primarily we keep the Facebook page for the fact of, you know, she likes to send pictures to her family, communicate with friends and stuff in Alabama. But man, when we go down through Alabama, uh, and we go down to her home church, and we go down to her area down there, everybody comes to see, not me, they come to see my wife. You know why? Because my wife's one of the most friendliest people I know. When I first married her, she's all, of course, you know, things have changed now with having our kids, and most of her time is occupied to our family. But man, before my wife started having kids, I mean, she was, she was uh, uh, someone who initiated friendships all over the place. That's the kind of friendships we need to have. That's the kind of people we need to be. A man that has friends must, must show himself friendly. And so there's been times where people have said to me, Pastor, I just don't have a lot of friends. That's nobody's fault but your own. Because the Bible says a man that has friends must show himself friendly. You need to take it upon yourself to initiate relationships and be a friend. Be a friend to the friendless. I tell my kids whether they obey it or not. I think they do. They tell me they do. But I say, look, if you're ever at school and someone's getting picked on, if someone's being made fun of, if someone is laughing at another person, you stand up for that person. And you rebuke the other person. You tell them, leave them alone. That's not right. Stand up for the friendless. Initiate the friendless. Initiate the relationship to the friendless. Jonathan did this to David. I want to ask you tonight, and I just wanted, I, you know, I wanted to kind of mention that in one of my sermons the last couple Sundays, and I haven't been able to do that, and so I wanted to share that with you tonight. But I want to ask you, are you a friend? Are you a friend? I want to be a friendly church. I want people that when visitors come in this building, when they come to our assembly, when they come to our services, they go away saying, boy, that was a friendly church. Now, I'll tell you, I'll be honest with you, I've had, I've had a few, few people down through the years that say, the, you know, there was rude people. But I've had far more people, far more people say, wow, it's a very friendly church. Everybody shook my hand and said hello. But look now, if we're not careful... If we're not careful, we'll have a visitor come in. And by the way, if a visitor comes to our church, do you know why they're coming to our church? They're looking for something. They're searching for something. We had one guy come through here a couple years ago. And I said, what, man, what brought you in? He says, man, I'm just honestly, I'm looking for, for just some, some friendship. And that was his words, not mine. And if we're not careful, we can get so self-absorbed and so focused on our problems. Look, you got how many got problems? Right? We all got them. We get it. There's not one person in here that is immune and exempt from problems. We got it. Get over it. We all got them. But when we come here, let's not start focusing on ourselves. Let's start focusing on the needs of others. Amen? And let's start being friendly to those who are friendless. All right?